Kiddos, you can be dismissed, those up through third grade. You are in Second Peter, which is the subject of this morning's message. But before we move in, I move into the sermon. I want to give a word of thanks uh, to you as a congregation uh, for your spirit of generosity. Um, and I, th I think since COVID, um, we, we quit passing the plate um, as far as receiving offerings. And, and so sometimes as pastors, this is kind of out of sight, out of mind, like the giving aspect of our worship. And so um, I'm just reminded and in, in, in want to thank you uh, for your spirit of generosity, how God takes care of uh, the needs of this church family, the ministries that, uh, that God so richly supplies us to do, both in uh, financial giving and in the generosity of uh, your giving in other ways, the community that you generate with one another uh, the service, the way you give of your time and you uh, use your giftedness. Uh, I was thinking of Philippians chapter 4 and uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, is, is writing here under inspiration and he gives a word of thanks to this church. Um, this church, I believe, held a special uh, part in Paul's heart. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Of course, Paul being a missionary, right? You, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Because I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble uh, and so Paul gives this word of thanks to the church in uh, Philippi. And, and so let's thank the Lord. I want to thank the Lord for, for you and the way you allow the Holy Spirit uh, to lead you in uh, giving of your resources, both uh, not just finances, but, um, but our giftedness, which, of course, it all comes from him, right? And so pray with me, and I'm going to pray for some of our families as well, just offer a pastoral prayer for those who are hurting this morning before we dive into Second Peter. Father, uh, we look again to you. Uh, there is no such thing as looking too much in your direction. In fact, Father, we, we confess that we don't look enough in your direction, uh, and Lord, we we thank you, God, for the generosity of your heart and the overflow of the Spirit of God who lives within us as believers. We thank you, God, for all the, the good gifts that you give to us and that out of an act of worship, we can, we can bring some of that back to you and we, we offer it back to you through our tithes and offerings. We certainly offer it back to you, Lord, in giving of our time and our talents, and the gifts that you have so graciously and generously given to us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for how you supply the needs of this church body. Thank you for how you supply the needs for the families in this congregation. And Lord, we give you glory, and we offer um, back to you just a portion of what you've given to us, and we ask that you would help us to consecrate the rest uh, to your service. We thank you for families in our church who minister so faithfully to one another, for small groups who, uh, who come alongside of hurting people, the small group of uh, Craig and Barb Brooks, and God, how you have used them and, and others beyond that small group to minister to Craig and Barb in these days of sorrow and sadness in their hearts. God, would you continue to comfort them? Thank you for how you're comforting Cheryl Roney uh, as she continues to grieve the passing of her sister, God, would you bolster her heart and her faith in you and trust in you, and, and God, uh, help us to care diligently for her. Uh, God, we thank you for um, 
for Marion and her testimony, even in Sunday school, of your faithfulness to her. And we just pray for your continued grace upon her. We think of Joanne Feather, the Lord, and we lift her up and ask that you would uh, just continue to, to meet her needs and help us to rise to the occasion. We ask, Lord, that you would do all of this, not for our glory, not so that others would see us, but, God, for the glory of Jesus, that he might be seen and known in this world, that your church would shine the light of Christ and the glory of the gospel in how we care for one another. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, we are in Second Peter. This is Dylan Red. Thank you, Dylan. You okay today? You ready? All right. <laughs> Today's message is simply entitled, God's Every Word is True. I totally ripped that title off from a song, uh, and so maybe you've, you've heard that song, and, uh, but it fits well with our text before us. God's Every Word is True. I don't know you, about you, but when I travel and I'm staying in a hotel, I typically don't unpack my suitcase, right? I, I just, if I'm there for two days, three days, even five days, um, I just live out of my suitcase for the time that, I, that I'm there. And the, and the reason is because I know I'm not staying, right? I'm not staying there in that hotel. I don't make it my home. Now, now they provide drawers for us. There's a, usually a dresser there, and, and we can pull out the drawers and... and make ourselves at home, but I know I'm not staying, so I don't make myself at home. I, I enjoy the hotel room, right? I, I enjoy the amenities, but I don't get too comfortable. I don't get too comfortable. I, I've had the privilege of visiting four other continents outside of North America, and, and so all, and all the times that I've traveled overseas and traveled to countries where, where they speak a different language, I, I, I travel there, but I, I don't learn the language, uh, I don't learn the language. I don't invest myself in learning a lot of the language. I might learn little, catch, little, little interesting phrases that I might need to use, like, where's the bathroom, <laughs> right? Uh, Hello, how are you? Um, and, and I even mess those up, okay? So, um, but I, I don't spend time learning the language because I know I'm not going to be there long. I'm just going to be there a few days, a week, maybe two. And I'm, I'm coming home. In other words, when, when I'm traveling, and you're probably the same way, uh, when we're traveling, we are aware of where our home is. And so I want to encourage us this morning that, that we as believers not allow ourselves to get too comfortable here. Not, not here as in, in this room, but here as in, in this world. I, I think we have a tendency to do that. I certainly do have a tendency to get too comfortable in this world. But, but friends, we ought not to allow ourselves to unpack our bags, become absorbed in the culture around us, forgetting that this world is not our home. You can, put this, you, you can include this as a little political service, a, a public service announcement going into this political season. This world is not our home. It's okay you care about your country. It's okay you want to be patriotic. Amen. Let's be patriotic. But listen, there, there's a line, right? Don't lose hope. Yeah. Don't lose heart in where your home really is. Like, like this country is not our, it, we are blessed beyond measure. Amen. Yeah. I'm out of soapbox now. This, none of this is in my notes. So, um, but don't lose heart and don't lose your mind. Don't lose your mind and lose sight of the hope that lives within you, that, that our hope is not in some American dream. No, no, no. Our hope is in a heavenly dream, Amen. right? And it is a sure hope, unlike the American dream. The, the hope that we have living in us that is, that is there because of the seed of the gospel that has brought life within us, it's there. It is a, an assurance an assurance of what is to come. So, so what's the danger? There, there's a danger in forgetting. There, there's a danger for you and I to forget that heaven is our home. Do you ever forget that heaven is your home? 
<laughs> like every day, there are probably moments in the day I forget that heaven is my home. Circumstances come in, overwhelm me, and what do I do? My heart starts fainting, my mind starts spinning. What am I going to do? How am I going to solve this? What? I become overwhelmed, and I lose sight so quickly that heaven is my home, and that Jesus is sovereign ruler not only there, but here. That Jesus is sovereign ruler in here, if we know him. So, so the danger in forgetting that heaven is our home is this. There is power. There is the power for life and godliness in our remembering that God has promised us future, his future presence. There's power in that. There's power in you and I constantly drawing back to our minds the hope that lives within us. Don't let that fire, that flame, don't let it dim. Right? That's, that's our day in and day. That's the, that's the ground of our spiritual warfare, friends. So, so the prophetic promises of God and God's word are intended to fuel our faith with hope for today, fuel our faith for today with hope of the future, right? So, so what, what we've read in 2 Peter chapter 3 are the promises of God, and they are intended, that, that future promise of another, of another world, a better country, a better home, with a better king, right? A perfect king. That is fuel for my faith and for your faith today. That, that like stirs us. That stokes the fan, that fans the flame of the fire that the Spirit of God has kindled within us to live for the glory of Jesus Christ in this world. So past fulfilled promises, the, pa the past fulfilled promises of God fuel our faithfulness today as we wait fulfillment of his future promises. See how it works? So, so, so since God's promises are all yes and amen, right? God is faithful to us. We've sang about it in like every song we just sang. God is faithful. And since God's promises are all yes and amen, then all people everywhere, in this room, outside of this room, on every continent, in every remote area of the world, all people everywhere should repent and pursue godliness through faith in Jesus Christ. Because time is short. Time is short, friends. So how do we overcome the dangers, our own danger of forgetfulness? Well, the Word of God, as you, I'm sure, have already figured out, tells us, right? Verse, look at verses 1 and 2. First of all, we remind each other of the Word of God through the prophets and the apostles. Verses 1 and 2, Peter is demonstrating for us how to be a good encourager, a good godly encourager. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you. He said, in case you think I... I was encouraging you too much the first time, I'm writing to you again to encourage you again. So, so don't think that you can, you can over-encourage. That You and I, that's, that's generally not our problem, that we over-encourage. Usually that's not our problem. Now, there are some Barnabases. Any Barnabases in the house? You want to be a Barnabas? I want to be a Barnabas. I'm not there, but I want to be. Peter says, I am now writing to you a second time to encourage you again, beloved, like, you people are dear to me, believers. I want to encourage you. I want to fuel your heart and rekindle and stoke the flame of your mind by reminding you. He says, in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind, the genuineness of your mind by way of reminder that you should remember. You get the idea? I'm going to stir your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter is bringing to remembrance to both his immediate audience and now to us, a couple thousand years later, 
that which we know to be true. Hold fast to the anchor because the anchor holds fast to you. That's how I might summarize it. Hold fast to the anchor. Capital A, Jesus is our anchor. Hold fast to the anchor because that anchor is holding fast to you. He's holding on to you. Don't you love, I love songs and, and the lyrics in songs of, oh, God is running after me. How many times do I make God run after me? How many times do you make God run after you because you and I are, are running in the opposite direction of God? But friends, God is a faithful pursuer. Let that encourage your heart today. God is a faithful pursuer. He is in hot pursuit of your heart. And he's in hot pursuit of my heart. This is, this is how to be a godly encourager to each other. So, so we just take a, a simple, simple two verses like this and, and we just learn from the Apostle Peter how we can encourage one another. Just bring back to remembrance what we already know to be true. And don't, don't just sit back on our laurels and say, oh, they, they know the truth. No, I forget. I forget. You forget. Yes, yes, we know the truth, but we forget. I remember, this, this made me think about that phrase, poke the bear. Right, this, this idea of stimulating our thinking. Peter is, I'm going to stimulate, I'm going to stir your thinking. He's going to poke the bear. Right, I, and it made me think of my dad. So when I, when I was a kid, my dad, it, it felt like my dad just worked and slept. That was his life. And, and that's kind of what I felt like as a little boy. I'm like, well, dad's home, and, and my dad would, would walk in the house from work, and I don't want to give up too much information, but, but he, would, he would come to the door, take his shoes off, he would go to the living room, drop his pants <laughs> in the middle of the living room, and sit in his chair, kick back, and <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. Like, like our friends who came over, yeah, you're just going to see my dad in his underwear. It's his castle. It's his castle. So, so me and my sisters, we, we brought friends over. We, we just know. I didn't think anything of it when we were kids. Bringing friends over, yeah, dad's in his underwear. You know, it's, it's life in the mailing house, right? But man, he would, he would hit that chair and he would go to sleep. Well, as a little boy, I want my dad's attention, right? Dad's home. I want, I want to interact with dad. I want to spend time with dad. And, but, but there's always this fear of poking the bear, <laughs> right? And, and waking him up. And, and man, there's just a fear that gripped my heart. It's like, man, if I, if I poke him, like, pff, pff, he's going to get angry with me, right? There, there, were time, there were days he would promise us, at least one day in the summer, he would take out, he would, we would do a family trip to Cedar Point, and, and almost every time, I remember this, every summer, he promised, tomorrow we're going to Cedar Point, and, and well, tomorrow comes, right? And as a kid, you're like, I want to go ride some rides. Let's get, let's get after it, right? It's like 7 a.m. It's time to go. Park opens in two hours. We want to get there early. I want to be first one in the park. Now about 8.30 rolls around, my dad's still sleeping. I'm like, all right, no holds barred. I go in there and I'm jumping on top of him. But a lot of times I was just afraid to poke the bear, in a sense. In, in the same way that my dad went quickly into a deep sleep, you and I can fall into a deep mental or spiritual sleep. We mentally sleep on the promises of God. And we mentally sleep on our hope in Jesus. Our mind is the bear that needs to be poked. It needs to be stirred. It needs to be stimulated by the word of God. Somebody has to bring the word and stir my mind and stir your mind. Remember, don't forget what Christ has done for you. Don't forget what Christ has promised you. Keep on going after him. Right? Friends, when a brother or sister is forgetting the hope and the promises of God, they need you to dare to poke them in the mind with those promises. Stimulate their thinking back to the Word of God. The Word of God is not a bully club. Think of it as a poking stick. 
<laughs> Come along, take the word and, and just with grace and humility, poke somebody with the word. Hey, remember what Christ did for you. Remember the hope that he's brought alive in your heart. Don't forget. I just tell you as, a, as just a, a quick, brief, personal illustration, when I sought to run, when I sought to run a few months back, and I was, I was, I was looking to run, it was due in large part because in my mind, I had forgotten the promises of God. Friends, I was preaching the word. I was teaching the word. I was in the word every day. I was praying to God. And yet I still, I still was, it was so cloudy. I was in the thick of despair. And I could not see my way out. And I needed people to come and poke me with the promises of God and remind me. So I want you to know this morning that, that's going to be you at some point. If you've never experienced that, it could be you at some point. Listen, I've been in the thick of those weeds. And people have come alongside of me and, and they, have, they have taken the word of God and they have reminded me, Jeff, you are not alone. And I just gently say to you this morning, you are not alone. If you're there today, you are not alone. There is a way out. And Jesus Christ is the way. And it sounds simple, and I know it's not, because our hearts get all tangled up and our minds get tangled in the pressures and the cares of this life because scoffers come scoffing. They're in the church and they scoff. You can't do anything right, right? Just some people, do they just want to scoff? And they'll, they'll, if we let them, we'll, we'll let them just sap the encouragement and the hope of the word of God and the gospel from our hearts. And I allowed that to happen. I allowed situations and circumstances in life to, to do that. And I would just say to you, if that's you, man, I, come and talk to me. I'll pray with you. I'll help you. You have brothers and sisters around you who will pray with you who will encourage you, who will point you and remind you of the promises of God like Peter is doing for us today. Don't let scoffers come and sap the energy from your heart and life because scoffers will come, right? Verses three through seven, he said, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days. Are we in the last days? We are. Peter said the last days basically covers from, from the, the ascension of Christ till Jesus comes again. That, those are the last days. So, so we, are, we are deeply into the last days right now, friends, right? We are, we are in the thick of the last days. And, and Peter says, in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, following their own sinful desires. There, there are plenty of people in our world who do the devil's work of scoffing, of casting doubt and discouragement upon God's people and upon the promises of God and upon the gospel work of Jesus Christ in your heart and in the church and, and in the society, in our community. There are plenty of scoffers who want to come and cast doubt on all of that God is doing. This is the devil's work. It's been his tactic since the Garden of Eden. When he first said to Eve, did God really say... Did God really say that? Is God withholding something from you? Is God holding back on you? What's the source of their scoffing? It's a repeated refrain in Peter. It's, it's their lustful passions, following their own sinful desires. Peter is in his first letter and now in his second, he said, this is... This is the passion, these are the passions of the flesh that come out in scoffing and casting ridicule and contempt and doubt upon the word of God and the work of God. Oh, friend, don't be a scoffer. Let's be encouragers. Let's be encouragers. These scoffers, I, I thought about Pilgrim's Progress. If you've ever read the allegory, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, I I thought about the characters of formalist and hypocrisy. 
whom Christian encounters in uh, Bunyan's allegory. Formalist and hypocrisy, they come from the land of vain glory. And they, they enter the narrow way, not through, not through the door, that is faith in Christ, but they climb over the wall. So, so they, they, they get on the way, not through Christ, but they climb over the wall and they proclaim themselves to Christian to be seeking to worship the king, but they're always looking for shortcuts. And they're scoffing at Christian who insists on staying on the straight and narrow path that leads to Christ. They follow, that is formalist in hypocrisy, they follow their lustful passions for the best of both worlds, the one now and the one to come. But their way in the allegory led to their own destruction. And that's true of scoffers today. Their way leads to destruction. In, in Peter's account, what, what is the content of the scoffing? It's an appeal to creation to cast doubt on the promises of God, verse 4. Right? They will say, Peter says, they will say, the scoffers, where is the promise of his coming? Did God really say? Is God really going to? Like, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. These particular scoffers scoff at the notion of the promised coming of Christ. Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they've been going since the beginning of creation. Life just keeps on going, right? All the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way back to creation itself. Everything keeps on going. Nothing changes. Life goes on. Where is the promise of his coming? Right? That's the content of their scoffing, casting doubt upon the promises of God. And then what's the correction? Peter corrects their scoffing. He says, basically, in, in essence, cre creation has not always been the same. You, you, you forget, you scoffers. You willfully forget. You neglect the truth. So, so there's three refutations that he gives. Three, three ways that Peter refutes these scoffers. And I'll work through them quickly here. Verse 5. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. So, so first of all, Peter, Peter argues that creation itself is evidence against continual continuity in the world. These scoffers say, oh, the world goes on as it always has. And Peter says, oh, no, no, God created. Like, like the world hasn't always been. So creation itself is an interruption, Peter argues. Right? Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the earth. So, so in the beginning of the creation of the earth, the planet was without form and void. That is, it, it was an empty wasteland. There was darkness and God's Spirit was there hovering over the waters I could sum this up in, with a couple of words like chaotic and uninhabitable. Right? Like in the, before God created in this early days of creation, it was, it was chaotic and uninhabitable. The earth was a wasteland. Then God spoke and the light was turned on and it was good. It was good. Then God separated the light from the darkness. God set in motion the scientific rhythm and rotation of day and night, evening and morning. Then God separated the waters above from the waters below and created the sky, the atmosphere. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from let us separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. 
God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas and God saw that it was good. So Peter writes that these scoffers willfully overlook the fact that the earth was created out of and through water by the word of God, that God spoke. The second argument against these scoffers saying that, oh, creation just keeps going is the flood, verse six. He says, and that by means of these, that the these is the water and the word. By means of the water and the word of God that then existed, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. That is, there was a cataclysmic flood in, recorded in Genesis 6 that is evidence against what these scoffers were casting doubt about. You know, oh, life goes on, creation goes on, it's, it's never changed. Oh, it changed in a big way in Genesis 6. And then the third, the third time he refutes their claims is in verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The consistent word of God is evidence that creation will not always be as it is. So, so Peter concludes that God, who has already judged the world once through the flood, has now reserved the earth for judgment by the same word in which he originally created. Only that, now it's reserved for fire, not water. Because God hung his rainbow in the sky, his promise in the sky that the world hijacks. But it's nothing new. They hijack anything that God does. The devil does it. Right? That shouldn't surprise us. But the rainbow belongs to the Lord. It's, it's evidence of his promise that he will not flood the earth again in a cataclysmic way. But the earth is reserved for fire. And the purpose of this end is for judgment, Peter says, and destruction of the ungodly, just as in the days of Noah. And just as in the days of Noah, people live and they marry and they have children, and they work their work. And in a time when it's least expected, the heavens opened and the water came up and the deeps broke up and God brought forth by his word the end of life as they knew it. Friends, we need to remind each other that the word of God is true. Remind each other of the faithfulness of God. Don't forget Secondly, we remind each other that God's timing is different than ours, verses 8 through 10. Do not overlook. So, so, so the scoffers overlook, verse 5, they deliberately overlook this fact. Verse 8, believers do not overlook this fact that the one, excuse me, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow or slack to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. God's timing is different than yours and mine. The passing of time, friends, does not diminish God in his personhood. God, is, God exists outside of time. God transcends time. God transcends his created order. Before any of the universe was created, God was. Today, as the universe is in existence, God is. And, and when God brings, when he speaks, and, and the consummation, this, this world is burned up at his word, God will be. He was, he is, and he will be. He transcends his created order. It really, a, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. This is a reference to Psalm 90. If you want to turn there, look, look, look it's worth the effort. It's worth the time, the couple of minutes it's going to take for us to read Psalm 90. I believe this is what Peter has in mind. And you'll see it in verse 4 specifically. 
But, but I want you to note, just as I read Psalm 90, you follow along in your scriptures and, and just note the themes of Psalm 90 and how they relate to what Peter is talking about in 2 Peter 3. Lord, you have been our, high, our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Like all things are going to be exposed in the light of God's presence. Verse 9, for, for all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80 Yet their span is but toil and trouble. Can you relate to that? The Bible is so relatable. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? You hear the desperation. I hear desperation in the psalmist's prayer there. Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's so powerful. God transcends his creation, and yet God is in it. God is not aloof. He cares for you. He cares for his people. His eyes are upon you. He beholds you as, as you behold him. He, his eyes are fixed on the righteous, on the ones in whom he has put his spirit. His eyes are fixed upon you. He does not lose sight of you ever. Oh, that's so encouraging. So encouraging. The patience of God is meant as a time for repentance. Like that's Peter's point in verse 9. Ironically, these false teachers use God's patience against him to argue that he's slow in keeping his promise. Where is, the, where is God's coming? He's too slow. We wait and we wait and we wait, and they hadn't waited nearly as long as you and I are waiting, right? down 2,000 years later. I say it's ironic because Peter says that God's patience in delaying Christ's second coming is to give them and others time to repent. God longs for people to repent of their sin and to come to faith in Christ. And so he waits. He waits not because he's slack in keeping his promise. He waits because he's patient and long-suffering for us to repent of our sin and to turn and to trust in him. Don't presume upon the patience of God and scoff at God's promises because he delays in Christ's coming. See it as the, a window of kindness God's delay is a window of kindness. Fly through the window. Come to him. Repent of your sins. Put your faith in Christ Jesus and cling to the anchor that holds. It's got patience for us. Because friends, the, the end is coming. Verse 10. Verse 10 is sobering. Bah, he says there, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's coming. 
It's coming, and, and you and I know not when it is coming, but it's coming, and we are, we are very close. Like, if you're lost in your sins, it is dangerously close. And, and listen, even if the coming of Christ is not close, if it's not in your lifetime or mine, listen, your end will come. It is appointed unto men once to die, and then judgment. So, so even if God should tarry through our life, our life is going to end. And so the end comes. And so how ought you and I to live? Like we need to remind each other how to live. That's the third reminder. Like we remind each other how we ought to live. We ought to live holy and godly lives. Looking for the coming of the Lord. Looking for the new heavens and the new earth. I want to close with this. Revelation 21. If you want to turn over there, you can. Revelation 21. We'll dig a little deeper into this part of the text next Sunday, Lord willing. In, P, in uh, 2 Peter. But I want to close with Revelation 21 and then Romans 2. But Are you looking for the new heavens and the new earth? Are your eyes peeled for the coming of the Lord? Are my eyes peeled? What did John see? Verse 1 of Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Interesting. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. All things have become new. I tell you, Paul says in Romans 8 that the all of creation groans for this. All of creation is groaning for this renewal. You, you jump down to Revelation 22 and verse 1. Then the angel showed me. Oh, oh this is interesting, church. Right? In, in Revelation 21, it says the sea was no more. But in Revelation 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the, city, the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will, they will need no light or, of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And He said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Every word, church, trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon, Jesus says. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This is meant for our encouragement Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, he says in chapter 4 there, he talks about the snatching away of the church, and he says, encourage one another with these words. What manner of life, church, are we, should we be living in light of the soon return of Christ? And yet we dabble in discipleship. We dabble in the gospel. We dabble with sharing the gospel. We a little here, but, but just enough to, to like satisfy ourselves that we're good. Now stop dabbling in righteousness. The 
king of glory is coming. Let the church of God rise up. The church of God stop dabbling in Jesus and, and go all in. Receive this window. Like the ungodly, the unbeliever should ought to receive this as a window for repentance. But the church, too, we dabble in our commitments, in our spiritual lives. We dabble in our commitment to the church, to Christ. We dip our toes in Christ and we got our, we got our feet in the waters of the world. It's a window, friends. Do not presume. Let us not presume upon the kindness of God. Romans 2, 4, I'll just close with this. Are you, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? We're going to give an invitation, and it is time for repentance. If you don't know Christ, it's time for Repentance. Run to him. He is in hot pursuit of your soul. We will rejoice with you. We will rejoice with you. We will welcome you with open arms into the family of God. By the grace of God, you can be saved today. But oh, church, believers, let's stop dabbling. Let's stop dabbling in Jesus and walk in the light, in light of his soon coming return. What manner of life ought we to live? Father, every word that you speak is true. God, help us to live like it's true. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and is already working right now in our midst, God. We pray that the devil and his little demons that like to snatch away the word of truth and the gospel, they would, they would have no place in here right now. They would have no place in any heart under the sound of this message, God. Oh, that your Holy Spirit would sovereignly call and claim your own. God, do that work. Because time is short, Lord. We are desperate for you. Show us our desperation, Lord. The desperation of the lost, but also the desperation of us, we who believe. Show us our desperation, God, and help us to cling to you and fly to you and hold tight to the promises because your every word is true. We give you glory and praise for the work that you're doing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and sing. You respond as the Spirit of God is leading you this morning. Yeah, but...